So uh, setting the scene for treatment of kidney cancer in 2014 is probably something very difficult because we still have a lot of unsolved questions. And what I'm going to do uh, in the next 20 minutes is to give you my idea about what we know about uh, this question we have about predictive factors, role of surgery, role of observation, choice of first line, when to switch from first line to second line, and we still have an open question here. How we should choose second line, and finally, what are going to be the new targets? And of course, I mean, you will hear about all these questions in the symposium, but what I'm going to try is to give you an idea of what I think here. So first of all, I mean, you are going to hear later on today, I mean, about genes, and uh, things are changing very rapidly in kidney cancer. We have a lot of new genes coming, and these genes certainly have prognostic values. So one of the most important uh, things is that we now have new genes that probably some of you really very well know, and some of you may be here for the first time. And uh, if you look at uh, CETD2, uh, BAP1, PBRM1, one of the interesting things is that all these genes are in the chromosome three, same chromosomes than, uh, than VHL gene. And that's for me a very interesting observation because when you look at these genes, they <coughs> seem to be quite mutually exclusive. So this is an interesting paper that was uh, published by the Jim Brogarolas group showing that either you have a mutation on PBRM1 M1 gene or on BAP1 gene, but having both of them mutated is quite exceptional here. And that's interesting because these genes have a prognostic value. So when you look at the survival of patients, depending on whether they have mutation on, on BAP1, on PPM1 gene, and this is two different cohorts, one from uh, TCGA and one from UCLA, which validated this observation. I mean, PBRM1 gene is a good pronostic gene. So if you have mutation on PBRM1 gene, you will have a better survival. If you have BAP1 uh, mutation, then you have a worse prognosis here. So certainly an interesting observation, and this is what you have when you put all these two genes together. And you can see that in the very rare situation when you have both genes mutated, and I told you it's very rare here, the, the expectancy of life is very, very short. So of course, these genes are probably going to become target for new uh, drugs in the future, and we still are waiting about knowing exactly the function of these genes, but as you see here, they are very prognostic here. We probably also have genes who are predictive of recurrence, for example, and there was a very interesting uh, publication at ASCO uh, uh, some years ago, which was recently published in Lancet Oncology, showing that CMET genes might be predictive for recurrence here. And one of the questions is, are we going to get a signature of recurrence in these patients here? And I certainly uh, encourage you to come at ASCO. I'm going to present, I mean, a validation uh, a, a study of uh, what uh, Brian Rennie showed some years ago at ASCO, showing that we can take some genes and putting some genes from angiogenesis, immune response, and some cell adhesion gene we can predict probably the risk of recurrence. So I will show you at ASCO that this is probably something that is going to become a very interesting test, I mean, to predict and select patients for adjuvant trial, for example, and also for the question of monitoring patients here. So moving to surgery, I mean, there is still open question about cytoreductive nephrectomy. But I think we heard very recently from the Hang and Tony Shore Consortium, very interesting data at ASCO GU, showing that, of course, I mean, if you look at a large database, I mean, cytoreductive nephrectomy seems to be better than non doing cytoreductive nephrectomy. So I always think that this is biased, and I'm sure this is biased, but the interesting observation they, they did in this uh, presentation is that, of course, I mean, the more you have risk factor in this, uh, in this setting, the more the benefit is becoming lower and lower. So if you look at risk factor four, five, and six in the IMDC classification, you can see that the benefit of cytoreductive nephrectomy is probably no uh, present here. While if you see poor, uh, one or two risk factors, it seems that there is a benefit in terms of survival here, 30 months versus 22 months, or 20 months versus 10.2 months. So that's certainly a very interesting retrospective observation. 
I still think that in presence of this type of patients, I don't know whether we should do nephrectomy or not. And you can see that this is a relatively big tumor, but still, I mean, the tumor burden is quite high. I'm not sure that we know exactly if we should do nephrectomy in this patient. And I still think that the Carmina trial, which is ongoing, is going to be very important to answer this question. And I hope we will finish it in the next two years from now, showing whether, I mean, nephrectomy followed by sunitinib will be uh, better than uh, sunitinib alone, or if, if, if it will be equivalent in terms of outcome. Third point I want to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to speak about is observation. So what we have put in the guidelines of, at ESMO 2012 is that some kidney cancer have very indolent course of disease. And we all know that uh, this is the case in some of our patients. And certainly justify a period of observation. And we have data from prospective trials. This is a target trial where we have shown that even when we delay uh, giving sorafenib in this setting, I mean, we still have tumor shrinkage and PFS, which is very equivalent. And we also have the same data from the record one trial showing that the PFS in the placebo patients are exactly similar when you cross over to the drug. So at least we can wait for a certain period of time. So question for me is how long should we wait? And that's coming for uh, one observation I have done recently when uh, I recently presented, I mean, data of long observation. I would like to share with you, I mean, two cases which really uh, trigger my, my question here. So this is a 58-year-old male. He had surgery for a clear cell carcinoma, and he has small lung nodules in 2012. And as I always do, I mean, I suggested to do uh, observation first. And this is his scan in 12, uh, 2012, and this is a, a scan in 12, 2013. So very, very little increase in the tumor burden here. So I still consider observation, and I had to, to, to see him three months later. But in the meantime, I mean, he had this bone mess which occur, which I never suspected to, to be. First observation, so some patients do that. Second observation, I mean, same, same kind of, of, of man. I mean, 59 year old, right nephrectomy, great free tumor, he had resection of a lung nodule, and he developed lung nodules in March 2012. So very slow-growing disease. In October, I mean, he had not really significant change in size of, uh, of these nodules. And in March, I mean, started to tell me, I mean, I would like to go to treatment. And in fact, I mean, the increase in lung nodules was very minimal at that time. And I said, okay, we are going to start treatment, and I tried to enroll this patient in a clinical trial, and then I did a brain CT scan, and that was a brain CT scan. He was absolutely asymptomatic. So it raised for me the question of when should we stop to observe patients here. And one question is, is tumor burden a potential predictive factor? And I think uh, we have done a very interesting work with Roberto Iacovelli when he was in my institution, looking at tumor burden as predictive factor of, uh, of prognosis here. So what we did with Roberto is to look at patients in Gustavo C. We were screened for two big trials, so the record one trial and the target trial. And we look at whether uh, tumor burden was prognostic or predictive. And interestingly, when you look at this, uh, at this cohort of patients, first of all, I mean, of course, I mean, tumor burden is becoming higher when you are in a higher risk of uh, classification by memorial classification. Of course, tumor burden is higher when you are PS1 versus PS0. But interestingly, it still is an independent prognostic factor here. And when you have a big tumor burden, you have PFS and OS, which is absolutely different. And what we've shown in this paper is that every one centimeter increase in tumor burden increases the risk of death of 5%. So that's certainly a very important observation. Does it mean? that there is a, a, a sum of ratio of tumor burden where we should start, we still don't know. But I think we need some prognostic factors to determine, I mean, when we have risk to develop new site of disease, when we have any risk of rapid progressive disease, and certainly, I mean, I would uh, pu uh, push you to go to Brian Rennie's presentation tomorrow and certainly at ASCO, because he had a prospective observation study, which is very interesting. Let's move to first choice, uh, 
to first line treatment. And of course, I mean, we have uh, free drugs which can be used in first line. And uh, I'm not going to spend time uh, about bevacizumab plus interferon because uh, you see, if you wake up tomorrow, I mean, you will hear about my, my view about bevacizumab tomorrow. But what about sunitinib and pazopanib? And of course, I mean, we have some comparative studies which have just been uh, shown, and you are all aware of the COMPAR study and of the uh, PISA study. COMPAR showed that uh, these two drugs are very equivalent, and I think the hazard ratio of 1.047 is quite convincing for me that these two drugs are equivalent in terms of PFS. And then we run this SPICE study showing that uh, when you look at patient preference in patients who receive these two drugs, one after the other one, I mean, there is a strong preference for pazopanib in this situation. Um, question is, I mean, these studies are not perfect, and you certainly have heard a lot of contradiction and uh, discussion about these two studies and uh, their interpretation. And the question is, COMPASS has bias? I would say, yes, they have biases. Certainly they have. But still, I mean, overall survival is not biased. I mean, survival is absolutely similar in more than one, uh, 1,100 patients. So that's very convincing for me that these two drugs are very similar here. Some people would say Pisces has bias. I would say no, it has not bias. It has limitation. And of course, I mean, we compare 10 weeks of treatment, and it would have been better to compare one year of treatment, but that's not feasible, in fact. Of course, I mean, not all patients were eligible for primary endpoint, but still, I mean, these two studies show that, for me, I mean, pazopanib is not inferior to sunitinib, and that patients do prefer pazopanib. So that's, for me, an important question. But what's going to happen with the new schedule of sunitinib, which are certainly very attractive one, and I'm certainly confident that this is going to change the scene? And that's actually an open question, and I, I still don't know the answer to that. So next question for me about uh, treatment of kidney cancer is when we should switch to second line. And that's a very open question, and we don't have any recommendation in the guidelines. I'm sure that racist progression is not a good choice. I think when we interrupt VEGF inhibition, uh, we have tumor growth increase. And the question is, can we look at this tumor growth increase? And this is something that we did with one of, of, one of my fellows, which is Charles Ferté, and we published this observation uh, recently in European Urology, is to look at how treatment changed tumor growth and how interruption of treatment changed tumor growth here. So the idea here was to try to look at tumor growth rate. So you look at tumor uh, burden, and then you look at change in tumor burden over time. Then you look at what happened during treatment, and then you look at what happened at the time of progression, and when you stop progression here. So of course, it's, it's looking at change in tumor growth here. And what we observe, this is with sorafenib, but that's the same with verolimus, that's the same with sunitinib is when you give treatment here, so this is placebo, this is before treatment here, on treatment you have change in tumor growth, and then when you start to progress, you have, of course, an increase in tumor growth, but when you, you stop the drug, although it was progressing, you have an increase in tumor growth here, and this is very significant at the time you stop treatment here. Which means that if you interrupt VGF inhibition, then you are going to see the tumor growing faster than if you continue on tumor inhibition. So for me, the, 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 the consequence of that is when you switch, you have to propose a second line which is active enough to do better than slowing the tumor uh, growth. And of course, I mean, uh, you have to define some patients where you have no question. I mean, primary refractory disease, I think for me, is a good, a good reason to, to change. New site of disease with progressive uh, Resist is certainly a good, a good reason to change. Outside of that, I still don't know whether we should switch or not or continue on. So if we switch, which second line should we use? I, I think after cytokines, I mean, every TKI is active. Certainly, axitinib induce a longer PFS. That's certainly what we observe with, with the axis study. But interestingly, overall survival is not better than with sorafenib. The question is, I mean, is PFS important here? or is OS the most important in second line? I still don't know, but certainly you can use every TKI you have in your hand after cytokines here. So what about after VEGF inhibition? We have in the recommendation and the guidelines, I mean, two drugs which are uh, recommended. One is everolimus, one is axitinib. 
and you certainly know the data from these uh, this, uh, trials here. So how, to, how could you select? Of course, I mean, the ideal would be to have a direct comparison between axitinib and everolimus, and we don't. So uh, although we should not do indirect comparison, I did it, and that's what I show on this slide, looking at uh, axitinib PFS, OS, sorafenib PFS, OS, and everolimus PFS and OS. So this is the AXIS trial. This is from the record one trial. So if you look at post-sunitinib patient, which is the only situation where we have TKI uh, uh, data in this uh, setting here, you can see that the PFS 4.8 months is certainly better than with sorafenib. It's probably not so much different from Everolimus here. So 4.6 is a, a retrospective analysis on, on pure second line patient from the record one trial. If you look at overall survival here, you can see that that's really in the same range. And even sorafenib, although it's not significant, has a higher number than all the other one. So very difficult to have a good idea here. And of course, I mean, everyone has been looking at this interesting study uh, presented by uh, uh, Tom Hudson and recently published in JCO, looking at uh, temsirolimus versus sorafenib in second line patients. And of course, it's not everolimus, it's not uh, axitinib, but it's an mTOR and it's a, it's a TKI, uh, only sunitinib treated patients, 500 patients, so quite a large number of patients. And that's the data which come from this study here. PFS was very similar, but OS was statistically different in favor of sorafenib. Yeah. So very interesting data. Should this comparison be uh, uh, put exactly the same for axitinib and everolimus? I think probably not. But on the other hand, I mean, we have here this, some data which supports that TK after TK is active and might be a good, a good choice here. Also, I mean, if you look at the data, and I added in the previous uh, table the sorafenib data from the intersect trial here, you can see that sorafenib is certainly an absolutely acceptable option in this setting here. And you can see that the survival in these two studies is very similar, 16.5, 16.6 months. So it raises the question whether, I mean, axitinib, everolimus are really better than sorafenib. I still don't know. I'm still I'm not sure of that. And that's probably an interesting observation from this trial here. So to summarize second line option, I think everolimus and axitinib remain standard of care because that phase three data. I think sorafenib has no quite interesting data in second line which supports that it might be a good option here. I think probably differences in toxicity profile are something that you have to take into account when you choose. And I think intersex study, although it should be interpreted with some caution, supports the use of TK after TKI more than anything else here. So to hand, I want to speak about new targets. And uh, I think the reason why we all are interested in new targets is not only because it's new, but because we have the feeling that we have reached a plateau with our drugs. We have seven drugs. But the PFS in every new study is, is plateauing at between 8 and 11 months. The OS, I mean, has been very much improved in the past 10 years, but now we are in the range of 26 to 39 months. So we think that we need new targets, of course. So uh, you are going to hear uh, in this meeting about two targets. One is the PD-1, PDL-1 pathway. No question, I mean, the Activity is promising. This is a, a slide probably most of you have seen at, at least once, maybe 20 times, from uh, David McDermott about activity in phase one of PD-1 antibody. And this is quite interesting because it's long, long response and quite important tumor shrinkage here. And this is one of the patients which really impressed me because patients who had received sunitinib, sorafenib, HDAC inhibitor in a phase one study. And you can see here that a very important tumor shrinkage over time, and this response lasted for a very long time from what I heard here. Also, it, there is some suggestions that some biomarkers will arise. So probably you will hear about this question here, but at least, I mean, we have an indication that maybe PDL1 might be one indicator. It's probably not the only one, and uh, I've heard from many people that some, from some PDL1 one pati negative patients will respond to the drug, but still there is a strong trend that PDL1 one positive patients have more chance to respond to these agents here. I think we'll have new uh, biomarker, but this kind of biomarker are going to be very important in the future. 
And of course, I mean, we have an ongoing phase three. Enrollment has been completed here. Uh, nivolumab has been compared with Everolimus, and we are to, all of you, I mean, expecting the data from this study where overall survival is going to be the primary endpoint. Probably next year, or at the end of next year, we might have the data from this study here. Second pathway which we are all interested in is the CMET pathway. There is a strong rationale, I mean, to use CMET inhibition. And the reason is that CMET is overexpressed in many clear cells, not only papillary tumors, you will hear about papillary tumors in this meeting, but in clear cells, especially when they go over time, I mean, clear uh, CMET is overexpressed. CMET expression is induced by VEGF inhibition, so if you put VEGF inhibition on, on, on tumor, I mean, you will induce CMET expression. So strong rationale here. There is a promising activity of uh, one of the uh, CMET inhibitor we have in our hand, which is cabozantinib, and uh, this has been, I mean, presented at ASCO uh, by Tony Schwery. Very impressive activity in very uh, highly treated patients. Of course, small phase two, but good enough and convincing enough to go to a large phase three, and the phase three is actually recruiting patients, and probably some of you are part of this study called the METEOR study, which is going to look at cabozantinib compared with Everolimus, exactly the same inclusion criteria as the nivolumab study. And the primary endpoint by difference to nivolumab will be PFS. So two promising pathways in 2014, nivolumab and cabozantinib. The question is, will we get a winner? And the question is, maybe we'll hear the data from these two studies next year or early 2016, and we will probably have a winner which will be the first drug registered for second line, and that's probably going to be a question here. So to conclude my, uh, my lecture, I think uh, RCC in 2014 is a lot of drugs, is a lot of questions. It's also a lot of hope, and uh, that's certainly something very important for someone like me who has been in the field of kidney cancer for more than 20 years now. I mean, we have a lot, a lot of hope and a lot of change in kidney cancer, of course. So what will be uh, in 20, in 10 years from now, I think you will have the answers tomorrow. I'm sure that Martin Gar is going to give all the answers tomorrow. Thank you very much.